guys join me giving a warm toolbox down there. Welcome to Mark Wicker. Mark. Thank you, Tom, for that warm welcome. It's great to be here. I'm honored and humbled to be here. I got to know about Toolbox and getting to know Tom and just what a great organization that is. And, and like I said, I'm honored and humbled to, to be able to share here today and flew here from Charlotte uh, yesterday and, and going to speak at another event here near Houston tomorrow and then one in Austin for Toolbox on Thursday. So three, kind of three in a row. Uh, but what a blessing it is to to share a journey when I was 32 years old. That was five years ago, by the way, when I was 32. <laughs> that was 33 years ago when I was 32 years old. I'm 65 now and a lot closer to the end of my life than I am in the beginning. And, and God has really wanted me to, to share this journey, to be a witness, uh, to be a witness for, a witness for Jesus, because it's a story. It's a story from ashes to beauty, and I think you agree with me when I when I kind of share it here today, and miracle that my wife stayed with me. We're married 43 years, and she told me murder was on the table, but divorce never was an option. And, and I think you'll see why murder was on the table when I, when I share all the things I put her through when I, in, my, in my early 30s. Uh, we grew up, my wife and I, uh, Ginger, we grew up in a small town north of Cincinnati. We actually live uh, near Cincinnati, and I'm in Charlotte often. That's where our headquarters are for Coca-Cola consolidated, but we have 102 plants throughout the U.S. bottling and bottling plants, uh, largest bottler in America, so 102 plants, and one of those is about four miles from, from where I live in Erlanger, Kentucky, near Cincinnati, and we live in Florence, Florence, Kentucky, but I travel about, on average, probably about three weeks, three weeks a month, so it is a, a very heavy uh, travel schedule, but blessed to, be able to, blessed to be able to share at the stage of life that I'm in, especially this, this journey, and even get to share a lot, even with our own people. In our, in our company with our 17,000 uh, 17, teammates. But we grew up near Cincinnati. I met my wife when she was in seventh grade and I was in eighth grade. I went to all our high school proms together and our parents, her parents, and my parents uh, were Christians. But I would say we went to church, my wife and I both at that time, but I would say uh, we weren't, uh, I wouldn't say we were Christians then. We just were forced to go to, forced to, go to church. At that stage, my 90-year-old mom still lives uh, lives today, lives near near us, and that's one of the reasons why we haven't moved to Charlotte permanently, where we can help my mom and see my mom as, as much as we can. My dad passed at 90 a few years ago, and they were 66 years married and wonderful people. Grew up with, definitely with the right moral compass in my life, but somewhere in my 20s, I lost that, uh, especially in my early 30s, I lost that moral compass. And that's what I'm going to really be sharing, uh, an example of selfish leadership, not servant leadership, but I'm going to share the journey I've been on the last three decades from selfish leadership to, to servant leadership. Uh, went to, my wife and I both uh, went to Ohio State uh, University. Uh, we're Buckeye fans, Ohio State fans. We were there during the Woody Hayes days. We were actually there graduating the year that Woody Hayes got, got fired. <laughs> was there during that time and graduated that year. And, and uh, full scholarship to Ohio State University. Then I had a full scholarship for a PhD at Cornell University in biochemistry in New York. So I went eight years of college, only a uh, child uh, out of four in my, in my household that went to college and, and went and got a bachelor's, master's, and a, and a PhD on full scholarship. And I can remember during the university years, you know, a secular university, I can remember professors at Ohio State, but even more so at Cornell at an Ivy League university saying, if you believe in God, you can't be a PhD scientist. If you believe in God, you can't be in my class. And you hear that for eight years? By the time I got a PhD in biochemistry at Cornell in 1983, I thought, and I, I would tell my parents, I would tell my friends about my parents, and I'd say they're Christians because they didn't go to college. They don't know better. That's where I was uh, by the time I graduated at age 25 uh, from Cornell University with my, uh, with my PhD in biochemistry. I graduated in 83 when the biotech industry was exploding. Genentech was just starting. I mean, I'm talking about wonderful jobs and company cars and buy homes the day you start. And, and uh, my wife and I were married at that point. And I mean, it was just unbelievable at age 25, the job opportunities that happened. I joined Ralston Preen out of St. Louis, Missouri, uh, my first job out of, out of college. And a couple years later, I was hired by one of their suppliers of amino acids and 
uh, and vitamins and that they were supplying to Ralston Prima, which is now owned by Nestle, and I was hired by a company called Degusa, uh, 30,000 employees and about uh, 40 billion in, in revenue, and I was two years in New York with them, four years in Germany where their world headquarters are located. I was Frankfurt, Germany for four years, and I spoke fluent German. Uh, Cornell requires a second language uh, when you get a PhD, and I was fluent in German. And so we moved to Germany, put our kids in a private school. We'll say a little bit about my kids. We tried for eight years to have our own kids, my wife and I did. And the doctor said we ought to consider an adopting, and it was easier or quicker to adopt older children than it was a baby. So we adopted after eight years of a marriage, a five-year-old and seven-year-old, and my wife got pregnant a month later <laughs> after, trying, after trying for eight years. And she was a Christian then. She was uh, 30 at that time, so she became a Christian. She wanted to adopt also a special needs child, so we have a, a special needs child the last, well, since, uh, since we were since we were 30 years of age. So for the last 35 years, uh, we've had a special needs. And what a blessing he's been on our, on our life. So she became a Christian at 30. And almost like my parents, she forced me to go to church with her and, and the kids. And, and I thought I'd be a Christian just because you go to church. I thought it was like joining the club. If someone would ask me if I was a Christian back then when I was 30 years so yeah, I go to church. And I'd name where I go to church. And boy, you can put an apple in a car, in a garage, but that doesn't mean it's a car. And uh, that's who I was. I was just like when I was when I was a child with my parents. I was going to church, but I wouldn't listen to anything that was being said. And I kept thinking about the next bone. I was vice president at Degusa by the time I was 27. Got responsible for acquisitions and mergers in Frankfurt, Germany. I started joining joint ventures for a company called ADM, Archer Daniels Midland, uh, number 56 on the Fortune 500, uh, 70 billion in revenue, and and 30,000 employees, and I was doing joint ventures with them. We were doing joint ventures in Europe and Asia, so I got to know the CEO real well of ADM. And so I remember him asking me one time, he said, you guys got a lot of bureaucracy at, at Degusa. And I would have been 32 years of age then. I'm six years with Degusa by that point, living in Germany at that point, and talking to the 75-year-old CEO of ADM. I'm 32. And, and he said, why don't you just join us, and we'll cut out through all this bureaucracy and do these projects together in Europe and Asia. And I said, I can't imagine leaving Degusa. Gave all the reasons uh, why I would never leave. Had great mentors in my life, guys that were pouring in my life. I, I wouldn't say I didn't know if they were Christians. Or not. They didn't share their faith, but they were definitely good, good men and having a good influence on my life. And I had the right moral compass when I was 32 uh, years of age. And I would call them servant leaders uh, at, at that point in, in my life. And I gave him all the reasons why I wouldn't join. He said, well, what, did, what sour do you earn? And uh, we made Deutschmarks at that time. This was 1989. This is even before the Euros. And I kind of calculated what the US dollar, I said, well, with bonuses and stock options, Degusa is a publicly traded company, second largest chemical company after BASF in Europe. And I kind of told him, I said, about 400,000 US dollars, which just doesn't go near as far as what 400,000 in the US would, would go. And he said, well, I'll give you a 350000 base salary, and I'll give you an opportunity and a contract that you can make $3 million a year, uh, a contract based on performance that are very attainable. And I just spent an hour telling him all the reasons I wouldn't leave the goose, and I said, where do I sign? <laughs> so I signed, and I came home, told my wife in Frankfurt, Germany. Our kids are in the German school, and not our special needs, but... Uh, we had one son that was born in Germany, so he was just in preschool, and our daughter was in elementary school in the German school, speaks fluent German. And uh, I told my wife, I said, we're moving to Decatur, Illinois. She said, what? Decatur, Illinois? She said, I thought we were going to stay in Europe, and then at some point you're going to go back in New York and be the president of Degusa. That's what I was being groomed to do, being groomed to, do to be at the world headquarters and then go back and be the U.S., North America Degusa president after a few years in Germany and probably within a couple years, because we were four years there already. And uh, she said, you didn't do it for the money, did you? <laughs> like I said, she was a Christian already at that point. And, and I said, well, they did give me about ninefold increase. And, and they gave me a corporate jet. This, uh, they made me divisional president of the biotech division and fastest growing division of the company. ADM makes a lot of fermentation products like ethanol, largest ethanol producer in the world. They make high fructose corn syrup largest high fructose corn syrup producer in the world. So very large food additive company. And then ethanol would be the one product that's not a food additive, but they're large in that too because fermentation from corn, everything they produce is from corn and, 
in soy. Like I said, number 56 on the Fortune 500, 70 billion in revenue. And I said, no, we're moving to Decatur and uh, I'm gonna start right away. And uh, I got there a couple months early because it was October of 89. Uh, I was uh, bonuses and stock options up to three million a year. I was eight years there and I earned two to three million a year for eight years in a row. And I was 32 years of age. The seven top executives, I was number four. I was divisional president of the fastest growing division and I was corporate vice president of the whole company. The CEO was 75 years old, the president was 69, I was 32. So I had plenty of room to move up. There's only three executives above me and they're double and almost triple my age. So boy, I thought, boy, I've got this, uh, I, this is gonna work out really well for me. And already divisional president at that point, the seven top executives each got their own jet. Uh, I had my own Falcon 50, my first week at work, two pilots were assigned to me. So out of the seven jets, I had access to those jets and pilots anytime I wanted to. And I'd fly to Scottsdale for lunch and Manhattan for dinner. Should have went to prison just for that. Some of the things that happened. <laughs> the, the CEO bought, uh, uh, was wanting to sell his house being 75 years old. He had told me about his house. He asked me if I moved my family yet. And I said, they wanted the kids, our kids to finish school in Frankfurt in December. So they're gonna wait a couple months and then move over to Decatur. And, he said, won't you buy my home? I said, tell me a little bit about your home. He said, well, it's a 13,000 square foot house. He lived in it for 30 years. It was the original house of John Daniels, who founded Archer Daniels Midland 100 years earlier. Mansion, uh, colonial, eight car garage, 13,000 square foot house, horse riding stables where your kids ride in an inside arena inside in the wintertime uh, with living quarters in the horse arena, living quarters for your security guards. Uh, three golf greens on the property. I mean, it was a mansion, an absolute mansion. I said, I don't think I can afford that. This was my third week working there. He said, it's nonsense. I own all the banks, he said. I'll give you a, a, a large startup bonus where you can be your down payment. Again, we should have went to prison just for that. <laughs> so he gave me a startup bonus. I bought his home. I think he hired me just to buy his home. Uh, <laughs> So three weeks later, I first I had a jet, now I lived in a mansion with an eight-car garage. What's a 32-year-old guy that's full of himself do with an eight-car garage? You fill it up. <laughs> that's making $3 million a year with bonuses and stock options and a $350,000 base salary. So I put a Ferrari in there, two Mercedes, two. Within a year, I had eight cars in that garage. My wife's driving a 10-year-old Jeep and I'm driving a $250,000 Ferrari, and I said, Ginger, I got a red one, I'll buy you a yellow one, I'll buy you anything you want. She said no, she wanted to be a good steward for God's money, and her 10-year-old Jeep was fine. And I couldn't understand that at all. Could not comprehend that, how she wanted to be a good steward for God's money, and I just wanted eight cars in the garage and $50,000 horses in the horse barn and driving around on a, flying around on a Falcon 50. I was Justin Bieber before Justin Bieber. <laughs> is what I thought at that time at 32 years of age. So uh, let's fast forward a couple years with a company and we always had, even when I started, the FBI was helping us on a Chicago Board of Trade uh, trading case right when I started in 89. When you're a big company like that, the FBI helps you out and helps you solve problems. And, and then we had a contamination problem in one of our plants and one of our fermentation plants and the FBI was helping with that. And I'm a couple years with a company and uh, being groomed, our CEO 75, 77 years old now, and the president 71 now, they're two years older, and they were grooming me to be the next COO, to go from divisional president to company president. They were grooming another guy 10 years older than me to be the next CEO. So there's two of us being groomed uh, for those top two positions. And that we had a contamination problem, and, and so we were talking to the FBI. My wife said, you seem awful nervous. She knew me since I was in eighth grade talking to the FBI where they're helping you. Why would you be worried about? And I said, well, I've been two years with a company now. They see me as family. So they started bringing me in to, uh, about how they do business. She said, what do you mean how they do business? You've been working there two years. And I said, well, seven months ago, they started teaching me and mentoring me and training me to take over an international cartel where they fix the prices of the ingredients, some of the ingredients that go into your foods and beverages largest food additive company in the world and fixing prices with our competitors. And they waited till I was there a couple years till they completely trusted me. Then my bonuses even got big, bigger. And so I started sharing that with her. I said, that's why I'm nervous. I said, here, their FBI's helping us solve a couple hundred thousand dollar problem. We're still in a billion dollars a year, billion dollars a year from our own competitors uh, or from our own customers. 
and working with our competitors instead of competing with our competitors. And she said, Mark, is that legal? And I said, well, Ginger, they tell me in the commodity business, they've been doing it for 12 years, this is what you got to do. And if I'm going to continue to move up the corporate ladder, I'm going to have to do this. So this is, this is what I got to do to move up, and no matter if it's legal or not. I said, it's not legal. It's breaking antitrust laws because you're, you're not working with capitalism. You're working with collusion and competing, uh, wor you know, working with your customers or your competitors. And we had a slogan that our competitors is our friend and our customers are enemy. And that was a slogan I heard often. And, and she said, boy, Mark, how much does the company earn doing this? And I said, hundreds of millions of dollars each year for, for well over a decade. And, and I said, you know, 30,000 people come to work doing the right thing every day at ADM, doing the right thing morally. But I said, there's four guys at the top that this is a secret that we have in the company. So it wasn't a bad company. It was just bad leadership, the four guys at the top. The other 30,000 people were doing the right thing morally and ethically every day. And I said, Ginger, but if I want to be the next COO that I'm being groomed to do, to be the next number two of the company, instead of divisional president, be the company president, this is what I got to do. She said, I don't know, Mark. I don't know if I can live in a mansion with 13,000 square feet and a corporate jet and, and there's a legal activity that's happening. And she said, matter of fact, I'd rather be homeless. She said, and, and she asked me who paid for that billion dollars a year extra that's earned from the price fixing scheme. And I said, well, basically the consumers pay that because Kellogg cereal and, and uh, beverage companies and, and when they pay extra for the ingredients, they have their profit margin built in. So I said, the consumers are paying that, but only a few dollars out of $50 of groceries. It's only a few dollars extra. It's not much, but ADM had 400 plants around the world. So it's affecting every consumer uh, around the world. And she said, you mean my grandma, Ginger said, on $200 a week Social Security is paying this? And we live in a mansion with an eight-car garage filled with $2 million worth of cars? She said, Mark, I don't know if I can live with this. And she said she was going to pray about it. we talk about it later. Like I said, she was a Christian already at 30. We would have been 32 at this point. 34. I was already two years in the company. So we're in 34 at this point. So she was four years already in her faith journey at that point. And when she told me she was going to pray about it, I knew I was in trouble. There had nothing ever turned out good for me when she went and prayed about something. <laughs> so she came back and she said, Mark, the FBI is helping you guys on this, on this contamination case. You're nervous to talk to them because you know you've got a bigger case right under their noses. And she said, I tell you, I, I just don't think I can live with this. And you've been involved only seven months. It's been going on for 12 years she said, I want you to tell the FBI, and if you don't tell the FBI today, I'm going to tell them for you. But she said, we're going to do it, and we're going to do it today. And I've known her since she was in the eighth grade, and I knew she meant it. I fought for about two hours, and I mean fault, and said, there's no way we can do this. I said, uh, it's illegal. I could go to prison for price fixing. She said, you're only involved seven months. It's been going on for 12 years. You'll be okay if you come forward. And I said, Ginger, the CEO is best friends with President Clinton. He went to President Nixon's funeral on President Clinton's plane. I said, this guy, a billionaire, largest shareholder, owned 5% of the, of the 56th largest company in America, a billionaire will destroy us. I said, one of the most powerful men in the world. And she said, her Jesus was big. Her CEO was bigger than my CEO. And I said, Ginger, who's your CEO? And she said, Jesus. And I said, well, my CEO lives seven miles down the road. We're living in his home right now that he lived in for 30 years, and he's going to destroy us. She said, God will protect us. We're going to do it today. And she did it. I don't know how many of you ever went and told the FBI you're stealing a billion dollars a year, but I can tell you it's an interesting reaction. <laughs> I can tell you firsthand. Reese Janet Reno, Attorney General at the time, William Sessions, Director of the FBI, became the largest price-fixing case in U.S. history, a billion-dollar theft for 12 years in a row, started by a stay-at-home mom raising three young children, my wife, Ginger. So we're sitting there, and we told the FBI, and I said, you guys got so many more important things to do. You got drug dealers in Decatur, Illinois, and bank robbers, and uh, I said, you don't need to be talking to us. And he said, well, what are we talking about? I said, it's really nothing. All these drug dealers I see on the curbs and, and all that. I said, you got so much to do. And he said, well, how much money involved? And uh, I said, it's really, I said, it's nothing compared to all these drug dealers in town. And Ginger said, a billion dollars. He said, a million dollars? She said, no, a billion dollar theft. A billion dollar theft? 
He said, how, miles, how long has this been going on? I said, all these drug dealers in town, all these things you FBI need to be doing. And Ginger said, it's been going on for 12 years. He should have just talked to Ginger and left me out of the room. Because <laughs> he got all the truth out of Ginger over four hours. At that end of that four hours, November 5th, 1992, uh, Ginger said, look, my husband came in, did the right thing. He told the truth. Uh, we got it out of him eventually. And, and uh, now you can do what you need to do, tap phones or whatever you do. And he made a comment. He said, look, Mark's the only guy that knows he's an insider. He's part of this. We can't just put an agent in there undercover. They, he wouldn't be that level that would be able to be in these international cartel meetings. So Mark's going to have to do this for us. He either has to start wearing a wire for us tomorrow or be arrested today. That's the choice I had, November 5th, 1992. And the next morning, I got up at 6 o'clock in the morning. They met me, shaved my chest, put microphones on my chest, had a microphone tape recorder attached to my back, another tape recorder and a notebook, and another tape recorder and a briefcase. And they wired me up at 6 in the morning every day for three years, the FBI, 1992 to 1995. Wore a wire every day for three years. The FBI would tell me there's a documentary with the three real FBI agents that's on my website, markwhitaker.com. It's called Investigation Discovery. And you watch that, those agents say, if, if these guys catch you, that's what they would tell me every week, they're going to kill you. And I heard that every week for three years. I lost 60 pounds. I'd be blowing the driveway off, which they show in the, in the documentary, three in the morning during thunderstorms. I'd be blowing the driveway off during thunderstorms with a gas leaf blower. I was falling apart because I knew if these guys catch me wearing a wire, I'm gone. And I knew at some point I'm going to have to be testifying against them and against federal court. So at the end of, uh, there was this green lamp following us around the world. It had the video camera in it. And the green lamp, the FBI wanted to show a jury what was going on, not just hear the audio tapes that I was making with the recorders. So this green lamp, they would get in the room that I would tell them where we're going to meet at, and it, they would control in the next room, like the next room from this room right here, they control with a remote control, and they could control that camera to zoom in who was talking. And it looked like it was from a yard sale, that green lamp. And that green lamp was at the Shangri-La Hotel in Singapore. $1,000 a night hotel. It looks like it came from a yard sale. Five feet from the 11 guys at the International Cartel. Two weeks later, that same green lamp was at the Mandarin Hotel in Hong Kong. Same 11 guys, five feet from them. A few weeks after that, it was in the Four Seasons Hotel in Chicago. Then it was in Maui, Hawaii. That green lamp was at two or three meetings a month, the same 11 guys for three years. And I thank God there was not a woman criminal among us. Because <laughs> a woman criminal said, would say, that green lamp has fallen us around the world. But when you've got 11 greedy guys that are getting millions of dollars of bonuses, they didn't see what was five feet from them. Greed absolutely blinds you. They didn't see what was five feet from them until that green lamp was brought into uh, seven-week trial in Chicago, and everybody was convicted. Everybody went to prison uh, from all the countries involved. And then they hit themselves in the head. Then they remember the green lamp that was five feet from them, from country to country and meeting to meeting for three years that made the videotapes where the jury could see what was going on. Everybody was convicted. The FBI was so appreciative of me, gave me a six-month plea agreement for all my help. Six months in federal prison. White-collar camp like Martha Stewart, no fence. So I would have went to prison at 38 and came out at 38 after wearing a wire for three years. We're sitting in Chicago, uh, Ginger by my side. My lawyer said, Mark, FBI gave you six months. Deal of a lifetime. Six months. Everybody else is going to go to prison for several years. And I said, I don't know if I can do six months in prison after just wearing a wire for three years, 10 hours a day for three years. And then Ginger said, Mark, let's sign it and get it behind us. I looked at Ginger and I said, Ginger, this is all your fault. I said, I had to wear a wire for three years because of you, Ginger. I'm going to do the opposite you want me to do. You didn't have to wear a wire for three years. I ripped up that plea agreement, threw it in Ginger's face, fired the lawyer on the spot, hired a group of other lawyers the next day, and fought the case for three years in the courts and got eight and a half years instead by going to court instead of signing that plea agreement. Went from six months to eight and a half years. I was so depressed. Wrote a 17-page letter to Ginger and my kids pulled my car in one of those garages and tried to kill myself. I was hopeless and helpless. I could not imagine going to prison for eight and a half years on a 10-year sentence. You get 15% off on good behavior. There's no parole in the federal system. You got to do eight and a half years. 
So I said, I can't imagine going to prison for that long. So I tried to kill myself. I was hospitalized for a month. Someone read about it in the newspaper about this whole case and about me throwing a six-month agreement in the trash can and all the mistakes I made. These are decisions made in isolation. We need people around us, just like you have right here. I made all these decisions in isolation. Look at the decisions I made. The worst decisions you could make. Didn't have God in my life. Ginger was making good decisions. I was making bad decisions. So a guy read about me in the newspaper. He was part of a group called Christian Businessmen Connection. He showed up on my doorstep a month after I attempted suicide, seven months before I had to show up in prison for eight and a half years. And he said, Mark, prison's going to be the beginning of your life, and you're going to find your true purpose in life with the journey you're ready to start. He's the craziest thing I ever heard. He said, prison's going to be the beginning of my life, and I'm going to find my purpose. I told Ginger, there's somebody out on the porch that's crazier than I am. <laughs> she said, it can't be. And... And I told her what he was doing. He's told me it's going to be the beginning of my life and I'm going to find my purpose. And she got to her knees and cried and wept. And she said, thank God, God sent somebody. Mark, I've been praying for you for 10 years. 10 years. And your parents have been praying for you their whole life. And God sent somebody. And I pray you go listen to this man that God sent. And I went out and I said, Ian, what do you have? And he's CFO of a pharmaceutical company. Five young children, school age and younger. He had a study called Operation Timothy. He wanted to introduce me to God and introduce me to Jesus. And I said, I said, Ian, I'm looking for hope. And I said, I'll do whatever I can do. And he started having Bible study with me six, seven hours a week for seven months before I went to prison and planted a seed that was very important. But I still had that eight years of college. <laughs> the sciences that was blocking that you can't believe in God if you're a scientist. And so... My second week in prison, a guy named Chuck Colson showed up. And Chuck Colson showed up. He was White House counsel under President Nixon, went to prison in the 70s for the Watergate scandal, became a Christian in prison, and it changed his life. He read about me in the Washington Post, and he saw his own life. He went to Brown. I went to Cornell. He was a powerful man in his 30s, White House counsel. I was 30s, one of the divisional presidents, one of the largest companies in the world. He saw a lot of myself, and he showed up, and he started pouring into me. And he said, Mark, this guy that's been meeting with you, Ian Howes, I told him about him. And he said, have you surrendered your life to Jesus? I said, Chuck, I have eight years of college saying you can't be a, a scientist if you believe in God. He said he went to Brown and he was told the same thing, just like I was told at Cornell. He said, Mark, it's a lie. And he started sharing with me some of the best scientists in the world. Even Albert Einstein, he showed an article, said only God can create man and only God can create the universe. And Albert Einstein said the Big Bang Theory is impossible. Sir Isaac Newton wrote as much about Jesus as he did about science. None of that was ever shared at the university. Francis Collins, who discovered the human genome, is a Christian. No one ever shared that with me at Cornell. And he showed article after article and book after book. A professor in Minnesota that I got on my knees that night, three months after Chuck Colson was showing me articles. This scientist that was an atheist, a biologist, was one to prove that God does not exist, being an atheist. And he got obsessed with it. He studied it for 10 years. And it proved to him that God does exist and Jesus is the Son of God. And he published a book called Surprised by Faith. Don Byerly's his name. I got down on my knees that day and said, how can you be a Ph.D. scientist and not believe in God? I've been lied to for eight years in the college, and I became a Christian at that point, and it changed my life forever. Changed my life forever. And I started thinking, I got eight, I'm three months in prison. I got eight years yet to go. How can I find my purpose in my life? And I looked around and said, where are people more helpless and hopeless than federal, than federal prison? And I started discipling them through the same Operation Timothy book and the Bible that Chuck Colson gave me, and I started discipling inmates in prison. And I helped them get their GEDs and helped Spanish guys learn how to read and write. At $20 a month, I learned $3 million a year. I earned $3 million a year for eight years, and then $20 a month for eight years. And they became the most productive eight years of my life in my 40s because I finally learned how rewarding it is to help somebody else because I'd never done it in my life till I went to federal prison. It changed my life forever. And then I got out a couple decades ago and I wanted to continue to serve and I joined a biotech company, started off like someone right out of college at age 49. Four promotions, I became the COO of that cancer research company, the number two executive after four promotions. And we started integrating faith at work. 
That company had a Christian CEO. California Biotech Company, a faith-based company. Cancer research. And now I work for Coca-Cola Consolidated the last several years. Coca-Cola Consolidated is different than Coca-Cola Atlanta. Our purpose statement is to honor God in all we do. Our official purpose statement, by serving others, pursuing excellence, and growing profitably. We have 102 plant sites, a chaplain in every plant. Over 100 prayer groups and Bible studies. It's a faith-based, purpose-driven company. Servant leadership oriented company, and God gave me a second chance at a large company, and this time he said, Mark, you're going to do it my way instead of his way instead of my way. And it's been so rewarding. It's been so rewarding, but it all started with brokenness. I thank God for brokenness. My wife and I get asked, what would have happened if I signed that six-month plea agreement? My wife said she wanted to kill me. Like, that's, like I said, that's when murder was an option and divorce wasn't. We're married 43 years today, as of now, 44 years next June. And Ginger said this. She said, thank God he didn't sign that six-month sentence. He would have never listened to Ian Howes and Chuck Colson with a six-month sentence. He would have never listened to him. She said, thank God he got eight and a half years. She even said that on CBS News, on national news in 09. She said, thank God for eight and a half years. I think two would have been enough. I would have loved to have been on that interview. <laughs> But I agree, six months would have not been enough. God changed my life. And I love this faith at work movement. There's no better place for ministry than our workplace. Even Billy Graham said the next big revival is going to be in the marketplace, and I believe that. I see hundreds of people coming to Christ in the workplace. We see our company as an outreach. Hire non-believers. They get to see the chaplaincy, the prayer groups, the Bible studies, the mentorship program, and lots of them become Christians. What a great place, this faith at work, what we call BAM, Business's Mission Movement. And I feel so honored to be a part of it. And it's so much more exciting than being involved in the largest price-fixing case in U.S. history. Yep. And I feel blessed to have my family. My fam wife came to visit me every weekend for eight and a half years. With good behavior, you move to a better place. She moved to three different states. As I moved to better places, she moved to three different states to live next to three different prisons. The last five and a half years, I got to do Pensacola, Florida Navy Base. One of the best prisons. If you go to prison, that's where you want to go. You don't want to go to prison, though. <laughs> Handball, tennis, golf. But you can't go home. You're $20 a month. You don't want to go there. But I thank God for brokenness. And I thank God today. My wife is the only reason that God gave me that I stand here today. God blessed me with my wife, and is why I stand here today. Actually, my wife, Ginger, is all the reasons I stand here today. And my children are all adults, all older than I was when this case even happened. And they're Christians walking with the Lord. And I tell you what, it's been life-changing. And I wish I would have had someone reached out to me in my 20s instead of right before I went to federal prison. I wish I would have started this journey earlier. Not sure I would have listened, but I wish I would have started this journey earlier. Nothing more important than serving Jesus and being a servant leader in the marketplace. And nothing more important than being a father and a mother and a spouse and take care of our families first, win at home first, and then you win at work. So thank you for allowing me to share here today uh, what a blessing it is to be here. And God bless all of you guys. Thank you very much. How about this? We, we'll, I'm going to take like two, two questions, and, and, and I probably have one. But anybody have like a burning question for Mark about his experience? Somebody? Go, Steve. Would you explain the difference between the Coca-Cola company that you work for mm -hmm. and the other one? Because I've been boycotting the other one. Yeah, Coca-Cola Company is uh, in Atlanta. We're headquartered in Charlotte. Coca-Cola Company is, is traded on the New York Stock Exchange. We're traded on the NASDAQ under the ticker Coke. C-O-K-E is our ticker. 120 years ago, the bottling side split from the, uh, the Coca-Cola company. It became a separate company. And then it was uh, franchised, so there were lots of different families throughout the United States at one time. Uh, a lot of cities by different families, and we've been consolidating a lot of those plants. And just even like since 2014, we went from 30 plants to 102. So we're the largest, largest bottler in America now. There are some other bottling companies still out there. 
but we're buying lots of, lots of the bottling company, but we are a different company than Coca-Cola in Atlanta. Well, our official purpose statement is to honor God in all we do by serving others, pursuing excellence, and growing profitably. And that's been our purpose statement for 23 years. Frank Harrison, our CEO and chairman, that was on his heart, and he's put that vision in place, and I lead the T-Factor initiative, which is transformation, where we get to implement that. Uh, those initiatives. And we also have T-Factor events where we had just last week 373 guys like yourself that don't even work for Coke. And we share with them how we integrate faith and work where they can learn uh, from that too. And we do those each couple months and happy to invite any of you to a T-Factor event where you get to see over four hours virtually and our CEO shares, our COO, our uh, senior, our VP of HR, but 10 of us, 10 of the executives at Coca-Cola Consolidated share how we integrate faith at work at Coca-Cola Consolidated, but we are Coca-Cola Consolidated, and in Atlanta, you're speaking of as Coca-Cola Company, two different companies. In fact, all the Coca-Cola you drink that comes out of a bottle or can comes from you guys. Yes, right? yes. It only comes, only found drinks comes out of Atlanta. Yeah. Bottling, Bottling separate. One more? First of all, comment, I'd like to say that it's God's timetable. I think you had to go through what you had to go through to be so dramatic, I mean, dramatic as it is right now. So I appreciate your saying. I'm just kind of curious about the other 11. What kind of prison terms are they? Well, for one, there's a lot more than 11 because some of the other executives, uh, some of the ones in Japan didn't show up for the trial, so they're fugitives today and they would be arrested immediately. Even 30 years later, they would be arrested and they cannot come to the United States. Some of the ones from Switzerland that we price fixed with Hoffman Roche did come over to U.S. Pres, uh, prisons. The, um, they got uh, th three years in prison, but again, I had a chance for six months. I was going to get the least. And I ripped it up and went to court, and so it was my own fault. I would have got six months. They would have had uh, three years, and I ended up with eight and a half years on a 10-year sentence. So I'm the only one that cooperated and ended up doing the longest <laughs> sentence of all. And the one who taught us how to do it and started the case, he was very close to President Clinton. He didn't do one day. He didn't do one day in prison. So the FBI are quoted in one of the books that uh, Moby Dick swam away and the minnows went to prison. All right, I have one question that I'm going to give you give a one minute answer to. All right, or about that. Okay, in a crowd of this size, there's always somebody who's in the middle of it right now. The wheels are flying off. Okay, so what you, you've been there. So what's the coaching that you give to the guy for whom it's all falling apart right now? Yeah. Well, you saw what I did when the when when the, when I made these decisions in isolation didn't have any wise counsel, anybody pouring into me. Uh, the only ones that were pouring in, into me were showing me how to price fix. My mentors were showing me how to be price fixers like them. So I say this, you want a good Christian people around you. And, and, when you're, and when you got that three in the morning, when I was out on that driveway, blowing the driveway off, and I wish I could have had someone to call that three in the morning call and say, I'm about ready to rip up a six month sentence and I'm about ready to rip that up. What counsel would you give me? And I never relied on anybody. I relied on myself. But it's so important to pray to God and ask God for leadership and ask for God to guide the steps and have wise people around you that believe in God to pour into you. Even though Chuck Colson passed 10 years ago, I still have older guys that are older and, and further in their faith that are pouring into me. I believe that we all need to have a Paul in our life like 2 Timothy 2.2, that Paul was pouring into Timothy. And I believe we'd have to have Timothys in our life. Our whole life we should be pouring into others and someone ought to be pouring into us, us that are Christian men, that are wise counsel, that, uh, and, and pray to God for guidance on the decisions we make and don't make those decisions in isolation like I did. Awesome. Well, thank you again, Mark. This is awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.